Assalamu alaikum guys, welcome to Fresh Grounded episode, I don't know, I never know, um, 300 and, I'll make a guess, um, nah, 347, 350, 49, 349, I don't know, 328, uh, so this episode is with Mohammed Saad, you'll notice that I am uh, in a different place different set uh we've kind of just made a makeshift set in our airbnb we are on the tertil uh retreat or the tertil team offsite so uh, at least once a year the team tries to get together uh and then we just work on a bunch of strategy and stuff like that because uh we are a remote team uh so for those of you guys who don't know uh, i run the marketing for tertil and this episode is with muhammad saad who is one of the mas- machine learning engineers i should say doctor uh muhammad saad he's a phd in robotics and uh just incredible just talk to him about ai uh understanding it oh that was the one question i wanted to ask him was about um AGI. I want to understand, but I, I forgot to ask him that, so forgive me. This episode is not about that. Uh, but we spoke about AI, we spoke about crypto, we spoke about personality traits. Uh, we at the retreat, as I mentioned, and we were doing like this personality kind of test. And we, Muhammad Saad and I, are the only two extroverts here, uh, where basically we get our energy uh, recharged by being around others, whereas everybody else gets their energy uh, from, uh, for the most part, like recharging while being alone so uh that was interesting that we spoke about that and just a bunch of other things so i hope you guys enjoy the episode let me know in fact because i do read the comments and it's, it'll be interesting to know because i suppose in the past uh fresh kind we've been doing this for seven years and like my mentality has been consistency get episodes out you know even if you're traveling even if um you're busy and you can't get the guests that you wanted to guess and so not that we could do that it's like that with Muhammad Saad he was incredibly inspirational and obviously what we wanted him on but in the past we optimized for always getting episodes out and recently I've been traveling so much and you know I think like life with kids them growing up and school and stuff you can start making excuses and so i decided recently no i'm going to go back to at all costs get episodes out as regularly as possible and so i decided to purchase some easier mics to travel with uh, some easier lighting so the quality might not be as good from the mics from the audio or from the visual uh but it's about consistency and that's always been our thing so I'm going to go back to that. That's what we kind of used to do. And so if you guys, so your feedback on the quality, the mics, uh, and if you guys are okay with the fact that we're not at the Freshly Grounded set, all of that is really important. So I can know whether you like for us to optimize for consistency uh, and therefore just get episodes out. Uh, so let me know, inshallah. And with that being said, enjoy this episode of Freshly Grounded with uh, Doctor, Doctor, Doctor uh, Muhammad Saad. Okay, right. Muhammad Saad. Is that can I call you Muhammad Saad on the phone? Yeah, sure. Okay, assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jazakallah for joining me. Of course, my for, pleasure. So this is uh, this podcast is uh, the first of its kind in the sense that it's the first one in at, we at the Tertil team retreat. Yeah. And uh, how do we, have? we have people sneaking. We have people around, which is perfectly fine. They're welcome to. They're not in the camera. Don't worry. And I've caught something why. And um, and you just arrived today. Uh, yesterday, so technically, but yes. Day, yeah. <laughs> uh, and we're in Bodrum, Turkey. Mm-hmm. How are you finding Bodrum, Turkey? Uh, it's very nice so far. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my first time in Turkey, and uh, your first time ever in Turkey. Yes. You haven't done yes. Istanbul. Uh, no. That's interesting. Yeah. I feel like that's like a, a normal place that most people go to on holiday. I I agree with you. Uh, I don't think I like going to normal places. Where have you been on holiday? Or vacation? Should I say vacation? Um. I think, you know, I grew up in Morocco, so uh, most of my childhood, I've uh, been like, you know, in uh, every summer almost in the north of Morocco. Uh, my parents really like uh, going to the beaches in the Mediterranean Sea. And uh, other than that, like, you know, just like some places around Europe, um, visiting family and like, you know, just some tourist areas. Is north like Tanja? Tanja, yes. Like that's where my so uh, dad is from. Tanja, Sorry, yes. Yeah. Yes. And then when I grew up, like, you know, it was mostly... Um, vacation time is also means family time because I uh, lived alone uh, for an extended period of time. So uh, every vacation time is actually a good excuse for me to go visit my family and parents. Nice. Yeah, and then when I and when I'm just have some time off in the weekends, it's usually like going for camping or like you know something uh, in 
of that sort. That was when you were growing up? No, that's that's when I'm old. Uh, even now, you go camping when you want to chill? Yes. Oh, nice. Yes. Why do you go camping? Because you you live in, can we say where you live? Yes, How transparent can we be with you on this podcast? Uh, I think you're pretty transparent. Normal, normal level of podcast transparency. Uh, I guess so, yeah. As long as they don't give them people my address, they don't like, yeah, have fine. people knocking my door. But okay. even that, that's probably fine. I'm gonna, if I move <laughs> soon enough, I'm going to be fine. <laughs> okay, so you're in Massachusetts. So where, do you, go, where do you go to camp? Or, or uh, usually New Hampshire, uh, Vermont, or Massachusetts itself. Yeah. Yes. It's, uh, it's a very <laughs> nice like uh, place. One of the things I actually I really like about living in the United States is actually like, you know, being able to enjoy the outdoors like a lot. Uh, I don't find that easy to do in other places like you know in europe in morocco uh and uh, other places i visited i've always found like the outdoors a little bit out of reach but in the u.s you that? feel like um i think it's uh civilization civilization like in all of these like you know other places wherever you go you kind of feel like you're not disconnected where in the u.s even though the east coast is like like crowded um it's you can still find some wilderness you can find bears and like wolves etc where it's like you know kind of a rare encounter like you know in other places uh in the world you're saying you can find th that wilderness in the u.s yes I it's e it's relatively easy to find or it to find you i think is more appropriate uh, have you ever uh, come across any uh yeah i think on my first night ever camping uh i think uh, well i i was in the white mountains in new hampshire okay and uh they post rules everywhere, like, you know, don't keep anything like, you know, smelly food uh, or anything of that sort in your tent. Uh, and uh, my first night, I put all the food away in the car and I forgot my uh, deodorant and my toothpaste and uh, a bear came, like, you know, sniffing all around during a the bear. night. Yeah. I think it was nice, alhamdulillah. Like, I think the, um, the ranger, like, over there, like, you know, came and, like, you know, uh, scared it away. But uh, you weren't scared. Well, no, I was making dua and like I'm making my shahada in case like, you know, I don't make it through the night. But I think uh, it was cool. Did you see the bear? Uh, no, like it just I, I could hear it like uh, breathing and like, you know, sniffing around the tent. Why people cause I've seen videos like that online. And it, yeah. what ma it makes me think is why would people want to go camping in like places when they know there's like bears or other. Um, I think it's for like uh, for the bears. I'm not sure. But like, you know, camping itself. It's like this disconnect and sort of like, you know, that allows you to really enjoy like the majesty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, you know, there is nothing uh, in a city or around the city that you can go where you f like you, you it does happen. But when you're in the middle of nowhere, you kind of like, you know, are more connected into really feeling like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's majesty in everything. You see like, you know, huge mountains, rivers, trees. Uh, and how everything is kind of like lives in this kind of harmony um, that's just amazing. Like um, something I was discussing with a friend here yesterday night when I just arrived is that the fact that you can like here, even though we're not technically like, you know, very far from the city, uh, but you can look up and see stars. And this is what people used over the years to um, to find their ways and mm. as I said in Quran etc that's the kind of stuff that's totally lost like in most places in uh, in a lot of like you know countries but like you know in some places like you know in the US you're you know in almost the middle of nowhere where like looking up you can there's no light pollution whatsoever and you can see stars clearly and like find your way of course I'm not experienced enough to find my way but it's a uh, it just makes you appreciate like a lot of what's around you and uh, and be more uh, thankful uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation and uh, gifts that he gave us. What's interesting is that we don't even understand the art of that. Whereas in those days, it was like, I suppose, a normal thing to, to a way to be able to navigate yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And since I was a kid, like uh, I think when I, since I remember reading about it in the Quran and asking my parents about it and I was told like, Oh yeah, because some stars don't move and some stars like stay, whatever. I always had this kind of fascination with um, space. I think even uh, that I think since then and even till now, I still want to go to space just for like you know the reason that like all right, this is something that connects with us. Like a lot of uh, advancements, whether it's in science, you know, astronomy, all this kind of stuff. Like you know, 
from like the Muslims were all tied towards like you know, because of we know how to, we want to know how to navigate, we want to go how, know how to make maps, uh, all of these kind of things, kind of like you know pushed like Muslims forward, and this is where we why we say like you know some of the time of the Muslims was the golden age, uh, because of all these sciences encouraged by like the Quran and the Sunnah etc. So that's one of the things that I really enjoy and I want to like kind of uh, pursue, and that from a young age I think it really motivated me to be like you know really into science and like exploring things and discover and learning about things in general yeah i mean i don't i wasn't intending to make the episode necessarily about this but it's like a natural uh kind of transition about <laughs> sure about tertil you mentioned about like the golden age and stuff and how muslims are at the forefront of so much of the well you could say like their equivalent that the equivalent in those days of what technology is now mm-hmm. and um maybe like that's become a bit lost mm-hmm. in recent times and then so i know like one of tertil's kind of mission statements that's often put out is the idea of us trying to reignite that islamic golden age yeah. and be at the forefront of technology yeah the fact that you just mentioned that that was something that you were so intrigued by as a child mm-hmm. was, did that in any way have anything to do with your pull into like kind of working in Tertil. And I should mention kind of as for the viewers that are listening slash watching that, of course, though we're at the Tertil um, retreat, um, I haven't introduced you. So uh, you work in ML in Tertil, Correct, which yes. is machine learning. Yeah. And that's as far as my technical knowledge goes, because I'm a non-technical <laughs> sure. member of Tertil. <laughs> Do you yeah. want to give a bit of context before then you go into like talk about why you joined Tertil? Uh, context about Tertil like or your, machine no, learning your, or? Yeah, no, like, yeah, I suppose like your role in that sense. Uh, yeah, so I do help Tartil with um, speech recognition, uh, and that mostly has to do with um, the letting the computers understand the sounds that uh, people uh, make while reciting, or actually their recitations, uh, and find if there is any mistake um, based on like what the machine learned over, like you know. Uh, thousands of audios uh, of hours of audios that like we recorded uh, and labeled as like you know correct and then like the work uh, that I do is basically teaching the machine to recognize each sound to a haraka uh, uh, or like a, uh, a harf and therefore like you know detect whether like you know someone is reciting correctly or making a mistake. And in terms of like, if you were to like cap- encapture like yourself as like a profession, like if you had to label it, would you would you say I'm a machine learning engineer? Or would you just or would you say I'm an entrepreneur? Because obviously you have um, black black sale, sale as well. Yeah. Um, if you introduce yourself, difficult... how do you introduce yourself? I usually don't introduce myself. Like I usually say I just work in in X. I don't want to yeah, like I because like I work I'm, in tech. Uh, yeah, I think if you want, I, I think it, this has a little bit of bad connotation, at least like, you know, from my perspective, like saying just I work in tech is like, usually uh, I just do um, uh, something that like people would not understand. Okay. Uh, where um, I feel like the way I want to work and see myself uh, is like what we're saying about like in the Muslims back in the golden age. Uh, when you go and talk to uh, a alim back then, uh, uh, a scientist, uh, they would not be very specific into what field they're um, they're into because they're curious about everything and they want to learn everything. So for me, like you know, uh, of course I'm nowhere close to any of that level, but I think what you can imagine me as is like you know someone that loves to learn about like you know almost everything that's like you know around there, whether it's like you know technical, scientific, or uh, or else. I just like you know I find like you know extremely interesting to learn about everything and that kind of keeps me excited and keeps me like not being bored uh when it comes to uh, i have i have a really short attention span uh and uh if if like something is not exciting anymore or it's something that um i've done long enough i basically don't want to do it anymore so for me kind of like the linkedin is like here's the stuff that i've done that i kind of like you know not interested in doing any any longer because like you know uh, i've been there i've done that etc okay so back so so is that kind of the original question which was like uh did your interest in the kind of pious predecessors um and the islamic golden age did that kind of 
Was that one of the pulls into kind of like you being a core member of the Tertil team? I think um, I think it's a, an opportunity that like you know doesn't happen very often. Um, it's very rare in this day and age to find something that is um, technical enough uh, that kind of serves like you know uh, a bigger purpose than like you know have enough money at the end of the month uh, to pay for like you know whatever you need uh, etc um uh by itself the fact that i can like kind of work on machine learning etc like that has nothing kind of it, it has some stuff to do with what i did during my phd but it's something very different i did my phd in robotics and maritime like you know uh, um, technologies and AI uh, has nothing to do with acoustics or anything uh, but the fact that there was an opportunity for me to be able to help in something that directly uh, uh, impacts how people interact with the Quran and hopefully like you know, help them uh, memorize Quran better without any mistakes it's something like you know pretty unique that um, it's really hard to pass on like it's it, it comes in and you're like if if you say no to it, like yes, it, there is there is an option. But the fact that you you can contribute and like you know help people um, in their uh, journey to becoming like you know better Muslims, I think it's it's a, a really unique um, how do you call it a unique opportunity that like you cannot just say say no to. And alhamdulillah, I find like myself like really lucky that Allah put that in in my path, and I'm able to help uh, now. So if that in itself puts me into a situation where I'm able to contribute as much as like, you know, the, the previous uh, people did, uh, I would be extremely happy. Uh, but definitely like, you know, that's one of, of my goals, but I don't think that I did like, you know, enough to deserve it. It's definitely from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's gift. I, you mentioned your PhD in robotics and I, I was speaking to Anas in, uh, in an episode of Fresh Ground a few months ago about um, AI as well. It's fun talking to people like you guys about AI because you're professionals and specializers um, <laughs> in that field mm -hmm. as opposed to just speaking to like someone like me or like my peers where we're excited about AI. We get excited when there's new launches and how we can utilize um, the AI products that we see. But in speaking to someone like yourself or Anas, it kind of adds a different uh, perspective because you know, you can have a deeper conversations about, you know, the potential of AI, but also the dangers of it. And, uh, you know, Anas gave, gave some great, like, points on on where he feels like he's at, like, and about how, you know, he, to summarize, he kind of said, like, it's very exciting, can, of course, be dangerous. And that's why it's important to kind of, like, take each step as it comes and not be too, like, uh, hasty and, 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 yeah. and, and, that, and that kind of tone. I'm intrigued about kind of where you're at with it. When you um, see... AI products being launched and stuff like that. Do you have the same feeling that I can only encapsulate in, in the following manner? So that if somebody, for example, was a, a diehard UFC fan, like, because obviously What's we know UFC? It's like, UFC is like, you, are you serious? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> UFC is like this. I was just giving off no, on my good. game of it's like. Good. You know? It's good that you don't know, I guess. Okay. But UFC is like Ultimate Fighting Championship, the oh, cage okay. fighting essentially, MMA. Okay. All You're right. like Conor McGregor, Khabib. They win no, okay, but fine. sure. Uh -huh. Okay. I I I've seen people fight in the cages. <laughs> Dude, like, is it just me? Like, uh, you must know no. Khabib. No? no, it's fine that you didn't. No. Maybe arguably, like, may, it's good it, that you don't know MMA. I guess, but maybe I think of some one of the memes or something like that you guys shared or something. Anyway, we can we That's can fine. We, you can like because it, okay, I'm trying to I'm right. trying to describe the concept. So yeah. Uh, UFC is this huge uh, brand now, okay. and also like it's pioneering the sport of mixed martial arts. Uh, I'm not. I don't want to talk about specifically MMA, but the point is, is if somebody watched UFC like mm -hmm. I want to say like 15 years ago, yeah, um, and 15 years ago it was on like f telly for free. Uh, yeah. The fights were like you know you were like essentially like a bit of uh, anomaly in 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 your group of friends if you knew about it, and then they became a shift where it became the cool thing. Okay, so but, I'm not cool yet. I think it didn't uh, come to me. No, yet. no, no. Because we passed that now. You, you, you could never come back. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it's, it's um, recorded. It became the cool thing. Okay, and then, but those individuals who were watching it when it was free and when it was like yeah. they were really into it, 
I, I think there was like this thing within them where they were like, oh, like everyone's speaking about this thing that I already knew about. Yeah. So that's. I knew feeling, it before it was cool. Right. Okay. Do you get that feeling with AI? Because now it's cool. And you obviously like spent so many years studying it and, you know, to such a high degree as well. Doctor. Um, no, I don't think so. Because at the same time, AI is moving such a, uh, a fast pace today that the stuff that I know today I are like, you know, probably obsolete by tomorrow. Uh, and um, it's also something that like, you know, very humbling that you know the more time you spend in, I guess, any fast moving um, industry or uh, whatever branch is that uh, it goes with, with what we say, like, you know, the more you know, the, the less you know, mm. uh, where you're, the more time you spend in AI and these kind of things, the 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 crazier things get, and it happens even more often when you start focusing on things. So anybody that does a PhD is gonna like sit and like you know focus on like you know a branch of like you know whatever science that he's gonna be um, studying, and at the end of it, if he was not careful of like looking around and finding, for example, what. Uh, everybody else was doing at the same time when he was like you know doing his proper research in his corner uh he's gonna be you know out of uh out of sync and this happened with like people literally with that were doing phd around the same like maybe a year older than uh, than me uh, so there's all this thing hype about like neural networks which basically are the lead, like why we have this like a huge um ai revolution um and i remember uh they had a, a friend who was working on uh facial recognition using like AI, uh, but AI was like the first generation of AI. Like we can talk about later, like the three generations of AI, but there was like the first generation of AI where he had to go manually and then find a kind of like um, uh, tricks and uh, shortcuts to quickly find like uh, faces in a bunch of them and match a face to another. Um, and this, and the guy spent like, you know, five years doing like, you know, his work, uh, got his PhD and he's happy about it. But within a year, all this revolution about like neural networks and like you know, machine learning, which is the second generation of AI, that comes in and then makes like you know all of his work obsolete within a year. Not only that, but it was like twice like you know uh, as fast, like you know uh, twice as accurate in finding faces, etc. And that's the kind of thing where these people like would not have been able to do like you know anything against like you know the ai or like the the moving but being in this kind of like you know circle you kind of like no circle but like being exposed to these kind of uh, uh stories and experiencing them also like you know firsthand makes you realize that yes you might know something today yeah you knew something before it was cool but like you know, we probably don't know it uh, any better than anybody else uh i bet that today if like even from the use cases of chat gpt you can just like go around like the internet and you can find people like you know finding extremely like you know nice ways of like you know doing work uh, or like you know improving results that like uh, i would i would never be able to to come up with even though if like you know i was exposed to it like you know beforehand etc um so yeah what, what are the three generations of ai oh, yeah so um so darpa kind of like darpa was just like the um uh, department of defense uh, I think it's the D Defense Advanced Research Project Agency uh, from like the Department of Defense of the United States defines three levels of AI. At the first level, which is like you know usually what we call expert systems, these are like where you go to someone that really knows how to do something, and you ask them to write them algorithms that reproduce what they're capable of doing. Um, so let's say that. You have uh, someone that's really good at recognizing, like, you know, voices. You try to, like, you know, ask them questions, et cetera, come up with algorithms that they write down, basically, like, uh, in what we call ifs. Like, we can approximate them by if statements, where um, if you hear this, for example, then you should probably hear this after that. Fine, so it's still, like, fairly manual. Yes. Fine. And then, so, then the second phase, which is, like, what we're experiencing now, where you feed a bunch of data to... Uh, a machine learning like an you know, algorithm that machine learning algorithm kind of finds the patterns between like you know the data and the results that you're looking for and gives you the answers so this is, is what we call what, training is that what you guys mean when you say inferences yes yeah, so inferencing is basically like you know getting a result 
So that's fine. Um, so, it, so the so you p- feed it a piece of information and then it makes an inference. It infers from that and then it turns yes. something. Yes. So that's out. the results. Yes. Yes. Right. So so but the training part is basically think about it as you have a black box, right? You have a bunch of inputs and a bunch of outputs. Yeah. So what you do is that you put like um, the training phase is that when you put the inputs in and then you have the outputs but then you try to find the link that correctly links the inputs to the outputs right so this is what we call like you no know, forward backward propagation we're not going to dive into it but imagine like you put some information in you try to draw a line between like the four the, the four which is from the data to the results and then from the results back to the data and see if actually like you can find a pattern that works for all of the data right that's the training phase and then after that the inference phase where like right you trained your model right now what you want is like if i give you this data can you give me can you infer to me like you know give me like you know the the results uh and uh and that's what we call inference in general okay. so that's like you know which is like basically the second pass like you uh, you do the training. That's like most of the stuff that you do, and then getting results is basically just like you know running inference, and that's usually like you know it's faster, like it doesn't take as much cost as much, doesn't take as much resources. Uh, so we're good on that. You're so good on that. And then, coming back to the third phase of AI, but that's not the third phase hasn't happened no, no, yet. No, no, no. The third phase doesn't happen is is not there yet. Okay. So the third phase is what we call explainable AI, okay. where AI is capable of telling you, here is the result. But here's why I say it's the result. Uh. And that's like, you know, is like, you know, an important leap because you can imagine that today um, in the Tartil, for example, um, example, uh, if I recite something, it's going to give me a transcription of my recitation, right? But it's not capable of telling me here's this is exactly this segment. In, like, it, do, it does give you the segment, but it doesn't explain to you how it thought about it. Right, mm-hmm. where like in the third generation of AI actually is the AI that can explain to you here's why this decision was hap- happened. It's most likely like what we're probably inshallah going to see in future products, uh, where like you can think about it as um, uh, even like the algorithm, whether it's uh, in uh, uh, Instagram or whatever. Like you, know, you don't control your feed, but the feed comes out automatically. It's not like you cannot really understand like you know how the recommendation is happening it gives you like some scores here's i give you this post for example because you know i saw that you like this 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 but like the the specific linkage of like you know how it did all of the uh kind of the process of thinking is not available and that's where the third generation of ai is and that's of course there's still it's like very early stages of research uh it's not like you know fully available but um some some experience that's funny i think that people like should probably uh do um which is like if you go to ChatGPT right now and uh, you can tell it, uh, I have three towels uh, that I put outside uh, under the sun uh, and have to wait three hours for them to uh, dry. If I have nine towels, how many hours would it take to dry? So an AI, because it doesn't, it, it understands the words, etc. But if you ask it this, it's going to tell you automatically nine hours. Right. Because it's for for it, like you know, it saw like you know what you're telling it, and it 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 automatically just thinks, oh, it's probably linear because like it's right. it's three it's towels, pattern, three yeah. hours, right? So nine nine, hour, nine, nine towels, it's nine hours. Yeah. But it's, you're outside in the sun, right? Yeah, so it's still three hours. Yeah, and I tried like I tried it's this. It's still three hours, right, right, guys? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did it. <laughs> he was doing that, and I was like, oh, it's three hours. Okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but if you think about it, like. Uh, even at the ChatGPT, I tried to convince it really hard to give me three hours. I was like, yeah, but it's in the sun. It tells me like it's nine hours. I'm like, but it's in the sun. And it's, pro- and it's like, yeah, it should take about three hours. And I'm like, what about six? How many is it going to be like, oh, about a little bit less than six hours? And I'm like, no, but it's in the sun. There's nothing. There's not enclosed, nothing, same energy, etc. Uh, and then and then it's got oh because they're close to each other I'm like okay I'm gonna put each one of them in a very like you know different corner how is that like in a in a garden whatever how long that is gonna take and it took extremely long time for it to say it's gonna take about five four hours four nine and I'm like still it doesn't make any sense wow. but for it it's like really hard to kind of like imagine these kind of concepts and this is all because uh, we hear this a lot with AI of today that we always say oh it's a black box it's a black box and that's especially because of these kind of things because today. The AI is not capable of explaining itself, and that's uh, where it I, I've seen screenshots of that before. And so you're basically saying that third generation of AI would be able to just say that takes three hours. Yeah, because it will be it will be 
able enough to understand the logic itself, like from behind. And also, when you explain, when you ask, ask it, for example, why is it nine? Or like, why is it three or whatever? It's going to be able to come back and tell you exactly the steps. It's not just the steps, because like, even you ask uh, ChatGPT now, why? The problem is that it will generate an answer not necessarily telling you, like, it's just going to come up, try to come up with words. So this is why, and I think ChatGPT and OpenAI, like the company did the really cool thing, which is they show you the words as like, you know, they're, uh, they're coming out from the model because the model itself, this is why it's called generative AI, is that as it looks a model, it looks, okay, what's the most likely thing that's going to happen based on all of the information that I got before, right? Where if you think about it, like, for example, even what we are doing, like, you know, uh, with Tartil and uh, inshallah uh, towards the future in, in Islamic tech, imagine like a chat GPT like uh, resource where you, when you ask it some information, it doesn't just give you some information, but it gives you proper citations and why it, it chose this citations and not another citation, right? Where like, you know, if you ask it, okay, what's the, uh, what's uh, the hukum of like, you know, someone that stole something? Uh, what should we do? And then it's going to go to all of the books and fiqh, etc., the hadith, whatever is happening in the Quran, and cites all of them, and then try to get you like a proper result out of it. That sounds so, like, I think that for me is where it starts to begin, become really scary. I think people talk about AI being scary with like, I don't know, like uh, on a basic level, like replacing jobs or, yeah. or, or, or getting so clever that, you know, robots can do ridiculous things and none of that really scares me in fact it all sounds like quite efficient but when it comes to the islamic side of it i started getting scared like like one of the thoughts that when you were talking about it just now that came to my mind was at what point does it go where's the line from it going from being like the same way that the scholars view a calculator which is like okay that's yeah. permissible you can count you can like you know do multiplications difficult multiplications and you know I'm, I imagine there's a consensus amongst the scholars that you know there's no issues with calculators. Where does it? When does it go from the ruling of that to like, oh, this can now have its own logic, and it's like, are we almost like recreating, trying to like recreate the creation of Allah or like something like that? And that obviously is probably not something that we are able to answer, but like that that kind of intrigues me. Well, a bit. Yeah, I think I think there's here's something to keep in mind. Like any technology that comes, we always have this challenge with it, no matter what. Yeah. Uh, from like you know, the printed books all the way to what we have today, because there here's something, and this is why like I think Islamic tradition is really good at, uh, and like anything else, which is the uh, how can we trace back like you know, the information? Uh, so we have that with the uh, hadith. With Ilm Rijal, like, you know, knowing exactly, like, you know, who's this person that, like, did the riwayah, who, like, you know, uh, is is he the only person, is he the only source of this hadith, is there someone else that listened to it, etc. So, this is, like, something that we did really well, like, you know, back in, in days, and alhamdulillah, like, we continue doing. Uh, and we continue doing that with, like, you know, the most known books, where, like, as you, as you learn a book, you study it with a sheikh, and then the sheikh, like, you know, gives you an ijaza, a license to be able to, like, uh, work with that book, uh, etc. Which is going to be the, the exact same thing with AI. Is that like you know AI? Uh, because nothing. For, sorry, before we move to that, like nothing now guarantees that a publisher of a book is not going to make slight changes in the printing of a book to promote his own thinking, right? Because what prevents like uh, any any publisher of like taking uh, a hadith book and then small making small changes here and there to change the meaning of things, right? To his own uh, thing. Regardless of what the the uh, imam uh, author of the book uh, uh, has written before, like they can make these kind of changes, right? Uh, and it's exactly the, the same is gonna be with AI, is that it's also a tool that people would be able to use, but we're gonna have to use them with enough precautions and like, you know, having knowledge. I think what's what's important, but this is anyway, like the kind of the one of the signs of, uh, the end of time is that we're going to lose a lot of like you know scientists and scholars that know exactly what they're talking about, um, and uh, and there's not going to be enough of them to go around for everybody to to work with. So um, so these tools, if we don't have scholars, of course they're going to be bad uh, on on everybody. Yeah, that's kind of like again then like where I kind of come back to 
it being something useful um, and, and and exciting from the angle of like anything with technology is that kind of, I suppose that you can track it back to like where it's using, yeah. uh, where it's like citing uh, and what information it's using, what books it's using. And that's kind of where I, what I found exciting or interesting about crypto when there was like the huge crypto wave. Because I think with crypto, there was like a, I was just looking back at like yeah. the crypto man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about it. Uh, so what I found interesting about crypto is that there was and still is some apprehension um, from from an Islamic element um, of crypto, right? Like they, it, it seems that people are divided on it. And what I found interesting though, uh, was the discussion that I had with a Ustad um, called Mu'awiyah Taka on Professional Grounded. If you haven't seen that episode, by the way, really recommend it. And like he's like super pro uh, crypto, by the way. Just give you a spoiler. Yeah, no, no, because I think that you would specifically <laughs> like the episode. No, I'm going to talk. So anyway, what I found right. interesting about his take on it, right? And it was hard for me to deny this. Mm-hmm. Is he was like, for example, sometimes we want to track, uh, like you want to donate money to charity. He goes, imagine donating money to charity, and you can see through your um, specific individual one-time token of your crypto yeah. you can literally track it not down to like the organization it was given to all like the country went but the person who like used it and what it was used for like yeah. it was like people want to be like donate and be account- uh, like yeah. and, and 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 hold charities accountable for the yeah. money they donate and this allows them to do that and and the other thing he kind of said was that that was one point that i was like okay that's quite convincing and the other thing that i that he said that was quite convincing to me was the idea that anytime you're uh, money is in the banking system, yeah. regardless of whether you like it or not. You you are in the riba system, right? Because mm-hmm. banking system is going to use your money for like to whatever, like to yeah. give out mortgages or whatever. And you are basically removing it from that when you have it in crypto and have it in crypto. So so I do f- always I, I, when I look at these. <laughs> what's, am I getting technical here? No, it's not about. But like you know, getting it out of like you know the riba system, but where you're putting it, like you know. It's is not it automatically something, yeah. So, yeah. so it's not questionable in that sense, like because, for example, for the tracking, you can technically do the same thing because every bill that you have has a serial number on it. You can technically go back and, like, you know, find it. Yeah, but exactly not really if you're like is. donating money online or something. Like yeah, so, so that's the thing. Like the moment you donate money online, your money is already like you know in a different blockchain. Like it's just that before, like. And system, the banking system that exists today. And sorry, like if if we diverge a little bit here. No, no, it's fine. The banking system that exists today is already in a similar thing than a blockchain. It's just that it's what we you again like kind of old generation. It's it's a a huge database that like you know it's either Visa or Mastercard or whoever like you know there's a like you know few of them that Swift the few of them that exist out there that are tra- managing like you know these transactions and like tracking them like you know in real time to yeah. make sure like you know the account and balances are like you know everything is fine it's just that the um, uh, crypto it's more decentralized and i think this is like you know, where it's important where like you know before you have like you know one guy having to to bookkeep everything and like they can charge whatever they want and they control everything where now with crypto you have basically it's open everybody can see and it's kind of like you no know, giving power back to the people uh but but still kind of like in similar places where like you know today you can go out and there's like you know people trying to sell you futures trying to do Mm -hmm. like you know the same thing like you know loans etc because without knowing it is that our society and the way it operates today cannot like people are just way too used to having like you know all of these kind of stuff the bank when you go deposit your bank the the bank keeps 10 percent of it Right, the nine, the other ninety percent in most like you know countries goes automatically to to uh, to uh, to give like you know to other people, right? So the value of the money that you like that's like going on in most systems, financial systems, actually is money that doesn't exist, right? Because like you, let's say, I have a thousand dollars, I go put it in a bank, the bank in like you know some countries is legally only um, uh, uh, mandated to keep one hundred dollars, ten percent, right? It's going to take the $900, uh, uh, the other $900, and give them to loans to other people, right? 
And therefore, like, you know, that means like there's $900, like $1,900. There's always like, someone missing. Nothing. Imagine like you know, then you go in and take in that 900 as a loan and then put in another bank. Then the other bank, again, puts 90 on the side yeah. and like the rest circulates it. So that's where like, you know, we have to be really careful about how this kind of stuff. And that's why like we see in like, you know, some countries where like, you know, they can have these huge booms, economic booms, like, you know, let people like, you know, grow, like, you know, buy stuff, get credits and like, you know, loans uh, left and right. Uh, and then at some point, like everything crashes or like there's a huge crisis, et cetera. Uh, but, that, but that's like, you know, independent from like, you know, crypto or not crypto, because whatever we do, when people, subhanAllah, like, it's like uh, people always like, you know, we're going to chase money and like, you know, make make more of whatever they have. Yeah. Uh, and crypto, it just, it was harder in the beginning to be able to have loans, et cetera. And like, you know, be able to trade on futures or like, you know, ups and downs, et cetera. Uh, where now it's like, you know, becoming easier. So... Uh, yes, I think that like, crypto has like a really like you know good thing, but it's the we moved away from the gold standard like we by like uh, the uh, humanity. I would yeah, say. we moved away from the gold standard not to be replaced by a crypto which is also exactly the same thing as a gold standard. Like if if that's really how how we're gonna like you know go towards it. Um, we we could just like literally just say oh you know what let's stop like you know using dollars and all this kind of stuff everybody's just, like everybody everybody you like your net worth is a certain amount of ounces of gold and that's how we're gonna trade with and that's exactly the same thing yeah that, that, it is super interesting so like I think like AI could, from from like a non technical perspective of like I would consider myself a layman in like the knowledge of like these kind these kind of worlds. It's interesting and it's interesting how these things pan out. You know, when the whole crypto boom happened, you thought, oh my gosh, like, are we, is it a realistic thing that we're going to start, you know, just using crypto instead of money? And then that kind of like died down. Now it seems like very far away from that. AI is obviously in the boom right now. So these things are always very interesting, but AI is much more like, I think, fun and exciting for me because obviously I use it every day. It wasn't fun and exciting for you for crypto because you not didn't jump on it early enough to make a lot of money and be well, excited. That, I, a, I would say like, you know, maybe that's the reason. Do you know what the but interesting thing about it is that when I was at university, I lived with this, this, this guy. Uh -huh. uh, everybody has a story like this when it comes yeah. to crypto, to be honest. But he was an engineer as well. And uh, he was like, dude, you got to buy this um, crypto, right? It's, uh, it's called Bitcoin. And yeah. he was like, it was, in, it was 30 pounds for one Bitcoin. So it's like, it like $50. So yeah. it's $50 for a Bitcoin, just grab it. And I was like, he's like, trust me, it's going to be big. It's, gonna, it's been yeah. going up so much. This was 2000 and gosh, I want to say 2012 mm. or 2000. And, yeah, I think it's 2012. Yeah. I think I graduated in 15. So I was like, oh, it was 30 pounds. I was like, whatever. And the, I basically said to him, well, how do I, he, he, he did convince me. He was like, you got to buy it. It's gonna, so I was like, okay, fine. How do I buy it? He was like, well, you got to have a digital wallet. And I was like, what is a digital wallet? And he explained it to me. I was like, oh, like, I don't know. Like, that sounds like too much work. Too much work. Yeah, so I'll forget about it. But he had a few Bitcoin, at least. Like, I think he really invested in it. I think he was putting hundreds in. So, yeah, I I, I didn't stay in contact with, with him, but I'm intrigued to know kind of what he ended up doing yeah, when he was he at like $50,000. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was interesting but um uh, kind of to round up because I'm, I'm conscious of time uh we obviously are here in turkey and one of the th exercises that we did we were speaking like kind of like just getting to know each other on the team because we're a remote team and so th one of the reasons i love the retreat is because i get to spend time with people like yourself who i don't deal with on a daily basis necessarily because we're in different ends of the company you know you're mm -hmm in like uh, machine learning and engineering and i'm on the technical side <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> i'm like obviously on marketing it's so it's like we, you know there's not much of an overlap there necessarily so it's fun because you get to meet these great people and like i think like you and i really hit off on the last retreat and stuff so it's, it's lovely yeah. to have you on but one of the exercises we did in this like getting to know each other and obviously the team has grown so much uh, since last year alhamdulillah is uh, we were speaking about personalities and personality yeah. traits and you and I were the only two people on the team that like uh, identified ourselves as extroverts, right? I guess or, like, so, said yeah. we're extroverts, And I found that quite interesting. So it'd be interesting to dive into that. Like mm -hmm. how, it, 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 what it, we, we gave very similar answers. So like, I want to like touch on them. Like one of the things that you said was that you get your energy from being around people. Yeah. And I said the exact same thing. And we did, because we did it on two different days. You came... Mm -hmm. Uh, late because you booked the wrong flight so thank you <laughs> just so everybody know <laughs> everybody um, knows now. 
And the other thing was, you mentioned something else. I can't remember what it was. Um, yeah, you, you you were asked about our learning styles. How do you best learn? Yeah. And I said yesterday, and you said today, that we learn by asking questions. And I didn't yeah. necessarily see that as an extrovert thing. But the fact that you and I both kind of mentioned that we're extroverts and we both give the same answer, unknowing what the other person's answer would be. Because mm. everybody else's answers were quite different and nuanced. Uh, like some people said that they like by, uh, they, they learn by doing, they just want to like get their hands dirty. Others said that they learn by like kind of reading about a topic and stuff like that more. And uh, you and I both ended up kind of saying we like to ask questions and you kind of expanded further and said you like to really know the basics or something. Yeah. And I was like, this guy's literally like, that's exactly what I'm like. Like yeah. I sometimes, and I think sometimes it might even get perceived like I, I'm i like a bit... Annoying? No, no. Well, thank you. Because I, uh, I was told that. Like, no, sorry, I'm not saying about you because I was told that. No, I think that something might get perceived like... I can tell you stories like, about this. This guy's asking such basic questions like, is he like mm. or dumb? Yeah. Right, and uh, it, 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 and it's like sometimes like I'll know something like really high level, uh, yeah. sorry, so really deep and like uh, technical, but I won't know the basic. And then I'd like yeah. like to really ask like some of that the incredibly basic stuff. And you said you'd like to know the basics of things as well. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I think maybe that's like for the learning part and like you being extrovert. I think that's. Uh, because you're not afraid of asking and like you know people saying like you know that like you know are you dumb or something like this i think you know that maybe goes well with like you know the 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 fact that like you know an intro extrovert like you know is capable of asking questions and like you know i, I don't care like about the other person like they're probably gonna think i'm dumb or whatever but like you know i want to learn i'm just gonna ask like the, the question no matter what i think that's the first thing the second thing is it does get annoying for some people like you know i'm saying this because like you know i was told that and like most recently uh, a friend was redoing his like you know bathroom and uh, uh i was there with like the the plumber uh, and i kept asking questions to the plumber so in the beginning he was like this guy is dumb like he, he told me that he's he turned around to the other guy he's like is this guy dumb or what like why is he asking me about every single step i'm like why are you like um uh whatever putting this products on this pipe yeah, what are you doing like, this yeah. what are you doing that so in the beginning he's like this guy is dumb or something and then um, and then my friend is like, no, he's not, it's not dumb. He, you know, uh, I think he's genuinely want to ask these kind of questions. And then I know I left and, uh, and then the guy asked him like, what does he do? And he tells, he tells him what I do. And then he comes back and he's like, this guy is just like, you know, now not dumb, but he's judging me about how I do things. And he thinks he does it better. And I'm like, still no, but it's something that like, I've, I'm, I've not been exposed to. And to me, I just like find it fascinating, like, uh, you know, the craftsmanship, no matter how it is. Yeah, I find it I things fascinating as yeah. well. Yeah. So, so I just like, you know, want to look at it and, and enjoy, like, I think how things are done or how things function. I think that just like something that uh, helps me kind of, uh, and, and I don't know, like, uh, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm an extrovert, but I'm also like, you know, relatively weird in like, you know, some sense where like, I, w I would definitely like you know, ask questions in like, mm, like in the wrong times and like you know um i i'm aware of that as well but you know it's uh, it is what it is like at some point like in the curiosity like it you know, kills the cat yeah i i i have a story of when i was in high school that way there's like a kind of a, a, a part where it could come across as like not having confidence or like seeking yeah. too much permission because i had a we had a math teacher who was temporary he was a um what do you call a temporary teacher in america i don't know i didn't study in america oh substitute right yeah, I guess. Would you call it something else? Yeah, we have the same words. So a substitute teacher. And he was from like New Zealand. And I can't remember his name, but everybody called him Mr. Gerbil, which was actually really bad because he was he actually got bullied by the students. I didn't bully him. Uh, that's what you said. No, no, I genuinely <laughs> didn't. But I, I sadly only remember him as Mr. Gerbil because that's what everybody called him, which is, I don't know obviously approve of that. But anyway, so for the content of the story, Mr. Gerbil said to me, he was like, well, he ended up leaving, right? Probably because he was getting bullied. And... On the last day that of that he was when he was leaving, I was the last one in the classroom because I was like finishing up some work. And he came up to me and just before he left, the last thing that he said to me, and I've always remembered this, is he said, and he'd been teaching us for like a whole semester, and he said, um, I just want you to know that you need to have more confidence in your work mm. because um, you ask a lot of questions and whenever you ask questions, 
uh, and you ask if your work is right or something like this, or you ask for permission to like do this. He goes, you, you're always right. So you're asking a question and you know the answer. So you need to ask less questions and have confidence in yourself. Yeah. And like, I'll ask him to like check my, like, am I doing this the right way, for example? Mm-hmm. Uh, and he'll be like, yes, you are doing it the right way. And so like, the, the final piece of advice that he gave me like on his last day was to have more confidence. And you know, you sometimes don't forget pieces of advice that people give yeah, you. Yeah. That was like one piece of advice I never forgot. I don't think I've quite tackled it. And I think people being an extrovert see me as quite a confident person mm. because I maybe find confidence in things that other people struggle with people struggle with like speaking in front of those people yeah. having conversation being on camera and i don't struggle with those things yeah. but then other things that i find people are very confident in i may not have that level of confidence uh even though like i have it in here yeah i don't have the confidence maybe to like i, I want to get it checked or something yeah well, I think if you had it, then it would be like a narcissistic, like, you know, crazy person. <laughs> they, well, I they, think we have a good balance. Because, because if you think about it, imagine like you don't know, have enough confidence, like, you know, doing all the stuff they already do. And on top of that, you're confident in like, you know, stuff. Then you're going to be just like a selfish person that's not fun <laughs> yeah. to be around. Uh, but uh, no, I think I think you're right. There's definitely this kind of thing, which, which to me, uh, sometimes um, I might use like you said, like, you know, the, the, the ease that I have in like, you know, talking or like, you know, just having like, you know, pretty random conversations as a way of like trying to hide my lack of confidence in like, you know, another, like, you know, uh, area. Um, so, so, and I noticed this, like, like if, if I'm in the zone where like, you know, okay, like, you know, I need to do something like, you know, this doesn't happen, but um even in general like you know i i think till today like i can easily like you know talk a stranger but like the moment i have like kind of okay i want to talk a stranger because of x or because of y then this kind of like you know there's like this kind of voice in my head that yeah, comes in as like too. yeah like you know you are you sure you want to do that etc and then like you know kind of like you know, start losing the confidence at that time so this is where like i found at least like you know personally that there's this kind of like the I think, three seconds or five seconds rule i don't know but like you just like count down and then just like you know, do the thing and don't think about it because i always felt that it's always that breaking the ice kind of is always the hardest the moment you have that uh you're you're good to go but at least like you know personally um uh, i always try to put myself in situations where like borderline i'm embarrassed uh, about because i think that kind of helps me not grow an ego mm. uh, because if imagine like you know you're like you say you can go out and like you know be uh like um uh, uh be like you know very outgoing etc and like also have like you know too much confidence everywhere then i don't think it's it's a it's a good uh person anymore in general at least like you know from what we see around so to me like you know the fact that yes like you know um i have that i think i just i, I don't want to get rid of it because uh I feel like it does help me kind of not grow uh, an ego. Is that like, you know, I, I I try to as much as possible, like I would say some stuff, uh, even though like, you know, they don't sound right, like, you know, from the beginning, but I say it so other people correct me. So I would learn something like, you know, from from almost like any interaction as, as much as possible. Uh, even though, like, like we, like we said, like, you know, sometimes just like asking a bunch of questions, like, you know, would make you like, like, look uh, not smart. But I feel like that helps kind of uh, tame the ego. Yeah, I, I think generally, like that stuff's again, like, not that bad. I, but what what I noticed with kind of using speaking a lot um, was also to be conscious of like upholding your isa. Because when I was, um, I think I've got better at this. I hope I've got better at this. But what I noticed was when I was younger, I would be okay with being the butt of a joke because of the yeah. idea of I, I I was so confident in not having an ego. I was so confident to not have an ego. Yeah. I was so desperate, in fact, to ensure that I didn't have an ego yeah. that I was like, if my superpowers, I'm even okay with like making like be, myself be the butt of a joke yeah. and stuff like that. And... As I got older, what I realized is is that it's okay to 
think of yourself like that. But the moment you start doing that in front of others, what you're doing is you're giving other people to, uh, permission to make you the butt of a joke. And that's when you start losing your izzah because people don't respect you because, uh, for, for, because of that angle. And so yeah. now I've managed to learn to tame it uh, yeah. so that I can try and use silence like sometimes I'm about to say something and I think you know what if you stayed silent in this moment would it would you be fine and yeah. I'm like yeah so then I'll stay silent as well so I I don't know like I think maybe you're right like when you don't you want to stay silent for for me I um something that kind of resonates well, not resonates with me but like kind of I um thought about a, not a lot but like for for some time is if you look at a lot of um, uh, mashayikh and scholars over the years uh, and the times, they would go and do something that does not look um, of their status, uh, whether that's like you know like cleaning bathrooms or like you know really helping like you know the poor in the streets or like you know doing some stuff that people do not associate with like someone with like such knowledge etc i think um and to me like you know that's where like the making like you know like you said like you know making fun of yourself etc like you know happens and i feel like yeah of course with age you feel like do people really need to make fun of you all the time and i think you have a really good point that like you know sometimes like you know maybe like you know not saying anything just like leaving the thing as is is uh, is better um uh, but I'm 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 afraid that uh, like at least myself knowing myself that's gonna like you know put me in situation where I'm like start thinking that I'm better than others. So I w- I am ab- absolutely like you know okay with people like making fun of me, uh, and I cannot like every time that I felt that it's not okay for people to make uh, uh, a joke out of me, I felt that like actually like you know maybe I'm like you know. Because at the at the end you think about it, it's like if you can make a joke out of you, uh, and you feel bad about it, then you think that you're better than whatever they're like you know laughing at, or that you're better than them, and they shouldn't be mm. like laughing at you for that. So no, that's where like you know I don't know how to do how to deal with it. I think there's other ways without making it, without being the butt of a joke though. Like for example, um, to 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 to, cr- to crush the ego, right? And I think like some of the ways to do that is. Um, if you have a set of principles and you unwaveringly stick to those principles, I think people have respect yeah. uh, of you without you having to like uh, damage your, without you having to like get into an ego thing. Mm. And the other thing I, I found was um, pr- like defending other people's isa or being conscious, just like keeping your eye on things and being aware of your surroundings and being conscious of individuals, how they might be feeling, what they might be doing. And then trying to look out for them in that manner. Like you notice how somebody's might be feeling or doing a certain thing. And then you try and make that thing easier for them. They're, like there's a level of respect that people have for that. And also, um, you know, we know that like, how, well, how do you win the hearts of people? And we know this from the sunnah, uh, f- like various ways that you can do that. Like um, turning your attention to somebody, using their name, uh, making somebody feel loved, uh, gifting. And there's even ways of gifting where like you gift people, you can give people your time, your attention yeah. and things like that. And I think those things matter. I think compliments are important, but done in the right way. Obviously over complimenting is bad, but there's a way you can give you, when you notice something about somebody and it's something that's like, uh, um, the good thing to like label and call them out on I think that's important and that's something that Hamza Zortis talks about as well so and there's like all of these like tricks and tips that I like to learn about so that I can not so that I can like be um, perceived greatly by others but so that I can be conscious of being a good person so that I don't have to fall into the trick of um, making a joke of myself or like yeah. you know trying to make up for it but um I think it's probably like a good time. We, uh, I said I'd only take forty minutes of your time, and I've taken an hour, so that's, that's all right. I do because you're probably gonna have to cut like a bunch of this out. No, the right. uh, beauty of fresh garden is that it's like right. raw, so I'm not gonna cut any of it. Okay, uh, but just okay for time. Of course, uh, my and, pleasure. Uh, inshallah, we we'll, still got another the rest of the week together, so I'm sure yeah. we'll, inshallah. we'll create Second, some great memories. Uh, inshallah, the return. <laughs> Thank you guys all for right. listening. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.